at the end of the day, selling is transferring a feeling. If you don't have the feeling, you can't transfer it. If you exactly. don't have a good, positive feeling, dude, you're an actor. You have to sell and run your business from a place of positivity. And however you get there, God bless you. Jeb, welcome to the show today. Well, thank you for having me back, Pete. It's it really nice to see you again. Yeah, I, I think I feel like I like just saw I just, you. <laughs> you did. You did just see me. And for those of you who don't know who Jeb Blunt is, he's the author of 15 best-selling books. In addition to that, he uh, is the owner of Sales Gravy. And him and Anthony Iannarino started a... A, a rock show meets a sales conference years ago that I finally attended called Outbound. And I would tell this to all of my rep friends. I didn't see any of you there. <laughs> I was in Atlanta and I didn't see it. Not one person from the furniture industry. So here's the deal. Anybody who goes to Outbound, register to Outbound, send me your registration Meet me at the, what was the name of that steakhouse, Jeb? Is it Chop House? God, there's or, so many of them. There's Chop House. There's Ruth Chris. There's Ruth Chris. It's Ruth yeah. Chris. So yeah. here's the deal. It's called the Pete Primo Supper Club at Outbound. I will buy you a steak dinner. So all you got to do is get to Outbound and I'm buying you a steak dinner. It's on me. And uh, let me know who all is in the club. There could be a guest appearance by some of our dignitaries, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. But, Jeb, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I have an unbelievably great bookmark for selling in a crisis. <laughs> the best bookmark that anybody could ever have. <laughs> the fanatical fanatical prospect. prospect and do not disturb, call block, block in process. And... You know, this is, uh, it kind of leads me back to the conference. I was there for, what, three, four days uh, with the VIP package. And by the way, all of my sales rep friends that you're going to go to Outbound, spend the extra money and get the VIP pass. It's well worth it. It's so much better. It's, it's the only way to go. And the last day, you put a slide up. And it said, winter is coming. And, you know, I was really pumped up and I got a gut punch. And then I felt a little kick in my fanny. And I said, thank you, Jeb. I needed that. Buckle up. Get ready. We all have to double down on our basics. And as I've been reading through this book, it is really it's not flea flickers and double reverses. It is <laughs> the basics in your face, unedited, very, very commanding as well as it should be. Because those of us who don't quite understand what we're getting into here in 2023, we're going to be caught unaware, unprepared, and having no momentum. And what I've told all of my rep friends is work really, really hard right now because the seeds that are going to be harvested in the first quarter are being planted right now. Some were planted a quarter or two ago. Some of them, some crops take longer than other crops to yield their fruit. So what I'm amazed about is this book looks like, and here's my question to you, it looks like you have written it in a way that it will become something that you could read a couple chapters every day for the next couple of years until we're all the way out of this and get a little kick in the fanny, a and a, a call to attention to the basics and help pick you up because what we're walking into, we're going to need to get picked up and, and we're going to need to deliberately make choices 
uh, to develop our selling skills, to develop our mindset, probably even more important than our selling skills, because skills don't come into play unless the mindset's there and you're on the field of battle, right? So did you do this on purpose? Yes. I, yes. I, I made a, an intentional decision when I decided to write the book and this was in late June after a meeting with my publisher, just going through some ideas and I, we, I would just pitch this idea and they got really excited about it. And then I started thinking, how am I going to write a book that's going to be easy for people to consume in the crisis? And it wasn't, I'm not the first person to write a book on this. Paul Riley wrote a wonderful book called Selling Through Tough Times, but it's a really thick book. There's a lot in there. And I didn't want to do a repeat of that. He already wrote that book and and that's that was, it. he covered everything you could possibly imagine, but it was, you know, it's a, it's a science book that he wrote. And I was looking for something that was a little bit easier for people to get a hold of that you could, like you said, you could pick it up in the morning, read a chapter. I like, I'm a big fan of 15 minutes a day of reading and reflection, move on to the next thing. So easy to read that would both kick you in the tail, Ted, you know, kicking the pants, get you moving, give you a little bit of motivation, make you feel good and wouldn't overburden you. Same thing with the audiobook. You can turn the audiobook on and you can listen to your car. And I want it to be a book that you can listen to multiple times. You can listen to parts and pieces of it. You can start at the end, start at the beginning, start in the middle, and it all makes sense. And what I did was I read, uh, I went back through, I wrote, uh, Jeffrey Fox wrote a book back in the late 90s. I think it was late 90s, or early part of the 2000s called uh, How to Be a Rainmaker. And I loved that book. And I went back and read that book again and read all the short chapters. And I thought this, you know, this formula will work for this book because people don't need, they don't need a full meal. They need, they need something to keep them going when everything is hitting the fan. So I wanted to respect what Paul had done in his book, which I thought was brilliant, and then be additive and give you something that you can carry with you in your pocket or have it on your phone or have it, you know, in your ear, it connects with you and it's easy. And so far I wasn't sure like how people would respond to it because it's not my normal book. It's not, I've never written a book quite like this book before. I'm overwhelmed. Like I just cannot believe how many just people out of the blue randomly are sending me notes, sending me emails, sending me text messages on, on DMS, posting it on, online. So there's something about this book that is instantly connected with people at the visceral level and gotten them excited enough to, to post about it. The only other book that I have where people really like they, they they get excited about it enough that they want to tell the world about is fanatical prospecting. So fanatical prospecting is that book where people read it and they go, I want to tell everybody about this book. This connected, this book is doing the same thing. And it's the fastest book out of the gate I've ever written. I've, it's unbelievable how the, the like the velocity and momentum on this particular book. So as an author, I'm really happy because I was super, super nervous because I'm like, you know, this could be a total bomb if people read it and go, ah, not enough meat here. And it's been just the opposite. People are so thankful that it's easy to consume. Yeah. Well, first of all, the reason I start shaking my head is – This is just part of my library of your books, <laughs> all right? And then I've got eight more on Audible that I've listened to an average of five to six times each. So one of the most interesting social post media I've ever seen, so, uh, social posts uh, that I've ever seen, somebody was kind of asking you what you believed in or what you and you said, read my books. And I said, wow, that really resonated with me because, you know, you, you tell stories uh, about your life in your books. You're, 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 you can tell when you read your book that this is you. And so I knew automatically this was going to be unbelievable and exactly what we needed. But I, I want to bring something to your attention that I, I'm sure this is deliberate because there's no way you do this on accident. But 
where you take these meaningful quotes and you make a whole page out of them. Yes. I don't know if people can see yep. that. That is incredible, he incredibly helpful to somebody like me who's a visual learner primarily. And the reason for all the audible is because I, I drive uh, 50 to 70,000 miles a year in my car, in my role yeah. as a oh. sales rep. And so I make my car a university, but my desire, my, my preferred mode of learning is visual. And when I get a quote like that, um, that stands out, it makes my job really, really easy. And it allows me to, to take that into my day. And I thought that was unbelievably uh, well done. And not everybody does that in all their books. It's, uh, it's, it's something that was a little bit different that I thought was really good, but thank I, you. I I, that was, a, that, I'm so glad that you liked that. That was an idea that, uh, uh, came to me in the middle of July when I was working on this book and, and I, I wanted to have quotes in there, but I, I wanted them to have it in a different way. And, it, you know, I, and I pitched this to my publisher cause that's something that every time you put a page in, it costs more money to print the book right. and, and they, uh, they liked it. So, uh, and I'm so glad to hear you say that, that you like that too. It's a, the, I, yeah. I worked really hard to pick out the right quotes for this book uh, in yeah. the interior and hopefully they're connecting with you. But they the, are. but the idea of being able to grab something that will teach you something, but put it on one page. So it's isolated and it doesn't, inter you're not getting interference from the other, other things on the pages I thought was important. Yes. Yeah. A hundred percent. And you know, this part six at the end of the book, protect your career. Unless you are very naive, that should be on your mind as a salesperson should be on your mind. And if you haven't been bright enough to think about it, I'm glad you thought about it for them. Um, not to be mean or cruel, but on 200 page 217, if you want to succeed at any job, make yourself invaluable, go the extra mile, make them never be able to imagine what life, what life without you there would be like Ross Matthews. I thought that was extraordinary, extraordinarily powerful. Um, how much time did you spend editing this thing? Because it seems so precise, so laser like it, it's just you must have gone through a lot of material and really had to edit and then re edit to get this thing down to where it was consumable in chunks. Yeah, I've got a, a really good developmental editor I work with. Her name is, um, hopefully, I'll say her last name right, but Christina Verrigan. And she works with John Wally and Sons, my publisher. And what what I do with with Christina is I I basically I, when I'm writing the book I do it on a Google Doc so she can see it at the same time I can see it and we're working together on it and I have to give her a lot of credit because we started off like we 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 had the idea we're going to write really easy to consume very short chapters and and as an author you know you start writing and then the chapter gets a little longer and you feel like you got to add something in. And she did a really nice job of in the middle of it saying, you know, these chapters are a little longer than these other chapters. Let's let's get them right. And you got to imagine all of this is happening. We wrote this book in five weeks. So it's and it's on my only job during those five weeks. I, I took everything else off my plate and all I did was write. So all of this is happening on the fly. So the, like the, the 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 quotes on one page and the way the book is set up. All those things were just happening while we were doing it. And it's one of the lessons in writing a book for me personally is if I can give myself space where there's nothing else interfering, it's a lot easier to like to have that, that creative thought process and those aha moments come out. But she would say, this chapter is a little bit too long and it would challenge me to go back. And then what we would do is just peck away and peck away and peck away and read it again and read it again, and read it again. I bet I've read this book a thousand times. And then go in and say, I can live without these words. I can live without these words. I can live without these words. And, and like you said, it's, pre, it's precise. It's, there's no fluff. There is, there, even, even the stories are really just 
dialed in as tight as you possibly can. I, 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 I've, you know, of all the books that I've written, I love this book. Like I, I can read this book over and over and over again. I don't get tired of it. Like, and I, and I like that. So it's taught me something about being a better writer and there truly is something, you know, the 10,000 hour rule. If you start with my very first book I wrote called Power Principles and you were to read this book, they don't even look like the same author wrote the books. And that that's just because over time I've gotten a lot better and I've gotten better at working with an editor like Christina, who is in my back pocket and working with me. And then she and I've collaborated on three books now. So she kind of knows my style and it's, you know, that ability to trust someone to give you coaching and feedback without being offended. I think that's, that's super important with a book. And, and then having someone who respects you as an author, I, it's my book, I'm writing the book and I'm, it's, it's my voice. So it makes sure, makes, making sure it's my voice, but also making sure it's tight writing, all of that comes together when you're building something like this. The, the fact that you're picking those things out, Pete, you, know, you, can't, you can't, it's hard. I'm trying, I mean, I'm smiling. I don't want to just, you know, totally grin myself to death, but I, you, you can't even imagine how validating it is to hear you say that and say these things because those, all of those things were intentional. We meant to do it. You and I haven't had a conversation about this. And the fact that that's connecting with you, it, it really makes, I, I, I'm, I can't even find the words to express it. It just makes me feel so good because so much went into this book. This was a, a heart and soul and the, the, like, and you nailed it. Writing the book was easy. Editing this book, it was, that was crazy hard. My gut feeling from writing and publishing one book, and I've got two others that I can't get across the goal line right now. It's just terrible. That's my problem. Is you wrote this in a very short time, and it gushed from your very soul. It just gushed. It just started to write itself. And then when you were done with that part came the work. Yeah. <laughs> so here's, this is going to maybe crack you up or think I'm absolutely crazy. And I, I'm not going to read the whole book guys on the show, but I have to share this with you on page 114. There's a quote and I'm going to read it. But I love Brian Tracy. Brian Tracy was one of my first guy, first guys, and he came up with Eat the Frog. But I said, I have more than one frog. <laughs> I have multiple frogs. <laughs> so when I got to 114, I just started laughing because it says, if it's your job to eat a frog, it's the best, it's best to do it first thing in the morning. If it's your job to eat two frogs, it's best to eat the biggest one first. Right. Nicholas Shamfort. I, I hope I said that right. <laughs> but I have multiple frogs, and now I know. Eat the biggest one first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that, that quote's also attributed to Mark Twain. So uh, Nicholas Shamfort was uh, back in the 1800s. He was the first. He was a Frenchman. He was the first person to use the eating the frog analogy. And, ah. and then, and then Mark Twain, you know, requoted him and, and it's attributed to him, but we went back and did the research because I attribute it to Mark Twain. And it turns out that Nicholas Chenfort said it before Mark Twain said it, uh, who ah. said it before Nick, uh, Brian Tracy said it and yep. Brian Tracy said it before I said it. So what do we say to people who look at winter is coming that's too harsh. That's too brutal. I'm going to not internalize it. I'm not looking at it. And I'm just going to go on with my life without acknowledging that we probably really need to double down our focus. We need to really double down on our skills. We need to really double down on our effort. And we really have to get serious about this. What do you say to those people? I'll quote Elvis Presley. The truth is like the sun. You can ignore it, but it's going to rise every morning. Amen. So, yeah. So you can, I mean, you can ignore the fact that winter's coming, but it's coming because the entire, our entire life, our, our, all the weather economy, 
our jobs, our relationships, everything that we do um, as we age, there's a season for everything. It's, you know, this is, I didn't say this, we, we can go way on back, right, to ancient times. This is wisdom from the ages. There's a season for everything. And we are currently in a cycle of decay. We are moving into a cycle of scarcity. That is a fact. It's not going to change. You can stick your head in the ground and you can ignore it, but you do so at your peril because you won't survive the winter if you ignore the fact that winter is here. And I say this to salespeople, and I've probably said this a dozen times this week, to sales teams, look around you. Take a look at all the people that are in your company that you're working with that are in sales. Most of those people won't be there at the end of this cycle. They're not going to make it because they chose to ignore the fact that winter is coming. But it's coming. And if you choose to pay attention to it and prepare for it and get your mindset right and get right with reality, you've got a real chance in, in the middle of this adversity to turn closed doors into big opportunities. You have a chance to take market share. As the winner starts to weed out the weak and the mediocre salespeople and the average salespeople, the, the, the noise that they were making in your marketplace, the crumbs that they were picking up, well, those are all going to be yours for the taking. So you're going to have more opportunity. That's what winner does. It, winner does what, it, you know, in, in the economy and in sales you know, rooms, it, it does what it does in nature, but it just, it just weeds out weakness so that when we get on the other side and we move into renewal, the salespeople who made it through, the ones that were able to survive and thrive, those are the ones on the other side that come out stronger and make a whole lot more money. And we'll move back into a season of abundance where a lot of mediocre people can come in and you can, if you can fog a mirror, you'll be okay. But we're not at that time yet. We are in a cycle of decay. Ignore it at your peril. In fact, Pete, I'll tell you this morning, there was a, uh, the headline in Business Insider was CEOs are shouting that 2023 is going to suck. So they're, everybody's saying the signals are there. Everybody is saying that winter is coming, and anybody who's not paying attention, I saw somebody on LinkedIn this morning said, ah, there's no recession. I'm like, just keep thinking that, and, and you're, you're, you're going to you know, put yourself into a, a bigger and bigger hole. So get right with reality. We know that we are in a situation where there's going to be a down cycle. That's reality. But reality doesn't have to define how you end up going through that cycle and how you end up on the other side. You define that. Adversity doesn't define you. Only your response to adversity defines you. Yeah, that's that's so good. And I'm just going to piggyback on that a little bit. Guys, gals, the snow's coming. Put your hat and your gloves and your boots on. And that's your focus, your skills, and your effort. You can control those things. What's happening out there, you can't control. And here's something, Jeb, and just my kind of reaction to what thoughts that were going on in my, my head when you said get right with reality. You know, I think I've been smart enough to be successful, but I'm not smart enough to figure out how not to do it. And that served me very well. And I thank God every day, Jeb, that I, I've kind of been a blue collar uh, sales rep. And, and I get this comment a lot in the last few weeks. Pete, what are you doing here? I, you're the first rep I've seen in weeks. What are you doing here? And I'm like, I'm doing my job. I'm, I'm here with you. I'm going to be here with you no matter what happens. I'm not going anywhere. Well, that's refreshing to hear because everybody else I can't even get them to return my phone calls or my emails. Yes. And here you are physically. So what I'm going to say to my sales rep friends is hopefully you're well healed enough that you can continue to travel, continue to be in front of your customers, continue to make every meeting count, whether it's in person, whether it's virtual on a Zoom call, whether it's a telephone call. But be assured of this. When this all clears out, you're either going to be in the timeout box because you didn't pay attention to that dealer and you might be out and you don't even know it, or you are going to have picked up quite a bit of business. 
you're going to be replacing other people's business who don't choose to show up because for whatever reason, it, the because doesn't even matter. Um, be the squirrel. You got to talk about this, Jeb. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I saw that and I started laughing and I said, yes, that is like one of the best analogies I've ever seen. We should be a squirrel. <laughs> we're eating frogs and we're being the squirrel. Hey, you know, all you got to do is just go look in your backyard. Look at squirrels. Squirrels know winter's coming. And what are they doing? 24-7, the only thing squirrels are focusing on is getting ready for winter. It is preparing. They are prospecting relentlessly. And that's one of the things I love about squirrels. I love, I love the fact that no matter what obstacles in their way, and if, if you think that you can outthink a squirrel or you can outlast a squirrel, go out in your backyard if you feed birds and put up every obstacle you can think of. And if you don't believe me, just go watch this on YouTube. Just type, type in squirrel obstacles and watch what squirrels do. They may fail. They'll hit a wall. They'll fall down. They'll fall on their back. They'll, get, they'll you know, wake up dazed and confused, and they'll go right back at it again. They will beat you every single time. They will find a way to get to that bird seed. They will find a way to get nuts. They will find a way to survive. That's what rainmakers do during a crisis. That's what the top salespeople are going to do. They're not going to allow the winner or the crisis or downturns or objections or adversity to get in their way. That doesn't mean they're not going to fall down. They will. Does it mean that they're not going to get hurt? They will. Does it mean that they're not going to fail? They will. But what, what squirrels get and they know at the visceral level in their souls is that persistence always finds a way to win. That is the spirit of the squirrel. Amen. So the other thing that cracked me up, and this is my, my little take on it, in the next few months, perhaps starting even today, but for sure in the first quarter of 2023 to at least the end of 2023 and maybe a little longer, go ahead and put away your rain barrels. You're not going to need them. What goes off in your head when I say that? Well, it, you know, the, the, this is the old Anthony and Arino analogy that I've stolen just, you know, yeah. I've stolen it so badly. And I, I, I talked to him last night on the phone. <laughs> he, he said, I heard you on a video talking about rain barrels. He said, but I heard you say my name. I said, yes, I, I give you complete attribution because I remember the very first time Anthony said that. But his Anthony's analogy here is that the the rain barrel is a stationary object that sits in the backyard with its mouth open, gaped to the sky, waiting for something to fall in. And if that is you, you right have, now, you have read your book a thousand times because yes. that's word for wor word. That's word for wrote. word. Yes. So, so if that's you, you're in trouble. And here's why this, this is the mindset shift we have to make. One of the things I say earlier in the book is that you should not confuse success in a bull market with brains. There are a lot of people right now who had, have had a very successful 18 to 24 months. Even though we went through a pandemic, 30 days, we had 30 days where we had a really bad lockdown, everything went bad. Outside of that, if you were in sales, you crushed it. You could show up to work, fog a mirror, you'd be okay. Why do your dealers say nobody's showing up and seeing us? Because the salespeople didn't have to. They would just, you know, the dealers were calling them. Starting, starting right now, nobody's going to call you. They're not calling. So if you're sitting around waiting like a rain barrel for something to fall from the sky, it's not going to happen for you. You got to go be a rain maker. You got to go out and be the squirrel. You got to go out and make it happen because winter's coming. And if you don't, you are going to starve to death. So I would love for you to answer in the affirmative, but I don't know if you're going to do that or not. Because this book is already a study guide and a book all in one. But I could see a follow-up book that actually has exercises based on some of the more pronounced yes. Okay. 
<laughs> working on it. We're working on it right now. And uh, and and we'll have a. It'll be a, we have a companion guide for most of the books. So if you were to go to to my website at salesgravy.com forward slash resources, you'll find study guides and book club guides for most of the books. We don't have them all, but they take a little while to get. They're they're free. We give them away. It's good for me. You buy the book. You have the the guide that goes with it. We're working on this one. And exactly what you said, the we in fact we just had a conversation about it that we we need a couple of takeaways, a couple of reflection questions, and then a an an action list. Like here are the things that I'm gonna do to 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 use this chapter to change something in my sales day. So it'll take us a couple of three weeks to get that put that together. We should have been working on it earlier. Uh, we didn't realize that people were going to be asking for it. So, but people are asking for it. So we'll have a workbook that goes with it. So one of the things that hit me about your book, Jeb, is this book could be written, could be read by anybody who's not in sales. And other than maybe eight, nine chapters, get a lot out of it. And if they can just ignore some of the sales stuff, every page means something to every yeah. human being alive. So I would say this, sometimes when I recommend one of your books or someone else's book, I I'll say this is for retail salespeople, or this is for B2B. This is for human beings. Do you want to have a better life in the next year? Then read this book because it is, bigger than sales. This is how you really approach life itself. It doesn't even matter what you do. I agree with you. I think it's, I think there's a, a great deal of this book that is applicable to everyone every single day. You know, clearly my, my lane is, is sales, the sales profession, sales leadership. But I think that's also true for books like Sales EQ. I think Sales EQ is a book that if you take the lessons out of that book that they apply in everyday life. I think you take the lessons from objections. You don't have to necessarily be in sales to have people telling you no. And if you take some of the lessons out of that book, it's easy to apply in everyday life. It's easy to apply in your personal relationships. And sales is, Daniel Pink said this, but sales is necessarily human. And since it's a human endeavor, and most people are selling something all the time, whether it's their ideas or, you know, what movie you want to go to with your family. We're all in some way trying to influence other people to comply with our request and to accept our opinions. I think every sales book holds something for every person. But, you know, believe it or not, I'm reading a book right now called How to Abandon Ship. And it was written in the uh, early 1940s in World War II for merchant marines. And I found it just fascinating. I mean, it's it's a wonky book about, you know, technical a book about how to not lose your life if you get torpedoed. But there's so many lessons inside this book that are applicable for life and for sales and for leadership. And I I, I think that I think that you know if you if you walk through the world that way with an open mind. And instead of being impacted by what something is labeled, sort of thinking about how you can learn from it, I think you can, I think you can take something away from everything. Yeah. So, you know, as I've walked through my career, I've always told my, my salespeople as a VP of sales twice and as the president of my sales company that I own now, you know, you, you've got three big rocks. You've got to maintain what you've got. You've got to grow. And you have to be able to have the ability to imagine what this account could be if they were fully nurtured and they were given every advantage to win. And, and, and you provide those advantages and grow that business. And then, of course, prospecting, uh, which whether you want to or not, in the best of times, you're going to lose 5 to 10% of your dealers no matter what. It, you know, weird things happen. Um and so one of the chapters, one of the parts of the book was part five that I thought was really important for sales reps, protect your turf. And I just thought, man, this is, this is the ABCs, but, but 
a lot of times we're looking for double reverses and flea flickers when we really should be blocking and tackling better. And what kind of inspired you to include this? It, I mean, it is manage your accounts, be responsive, develop account retention plans, which is magnificent, protect your prices. All of these chapters, be pro pro proactive, uh, find the problem before your competitor finds it. One of my favorite things being in the mattress business, I've said to my salespeople over the years, you're going to have SKUs that perform better than others. When you find SKUs that aren't performing, you either get them up to snuff or replace your SKUs or your competitors will. Yes. So what led you to, to I mean, I'm glad you put this in here. What kind of led your, you to include this? Well, if, if you are, and let's say you're an account manager, you're an account, account executive. Uh, if you're an account manager and, and your only job is to expand and retain your existing business, this is going to be a really important section for you because your job is going to be to prospect inside of your existing account. So looking for new opportunities there, mm -hmm. the prospecting matters, but protecting those accounts matters as, as much as anything because if you hold on to your accounts through the winter and bring them into spring, you can grow them again. They may, they may not be growing as fast during the winter, but if you hold on to them, you have a chance to grow them. If you lose them during the winter, you're probably not going to get them back because they either went out of business and that's something you can't control, but more likely they went to a competitor who didn't treat them for granted and came in with better solutions and helped them get through the winter. And then at that point, those relationships are established. So s making sure that you're retaining your accounts through the downturn is essential to growing on the other side of the downturn. You can't raise rates. You can't sell more. You can't expand relationships with accounts that you no longer have. If you yeah. are, if you are an account executive and you have both, like you manage a book of accounts and you've got to sell, then you got to recognize that you have to go grow new accounts. Like you said, you're losing five or 10% anyway, it's going to be a little higher during a recession. So in a normal time, your account base is dying a little bit every single day. So you have to add in new logos and, and new SKUs and you know, new products and new offerings. You got to add all those things in. So you got to be able to do both. You can't do one or the other. You can't bring in new logos and lose everything out the back door. And mm -hmm. during a recession in particular, savvy competitors, they're going to eat your lunch if you don't protect your turf. I'm going to eat your lunch. I'm a competitive person. I'm prepared. I got I've I'm just been, I've been a squirrel putting stuff away for 5 years just waiting for this to come along because the the really smart companies they've got a nest egg saved up so that when things go down you know south they can they can take advantage and take market share and I did that during the pandemic I I quadrupled the size of my company in the pandemic by taking advantage of the fact that a lot of my competitors weren't prepared and didn't have the means to maintain their relationships with their customers during that period of time. And, and when everything in my, you know, training industry is one in particular that gets hit pretty hard in economic downturns because it is a, a, a service that businesses can live without when they're trying to save the company. So, or at least they perceive they can. So if you're a weak competitor in that marketplace, you're not going to make it or you're going to have to hold up. So if you're not focused on protecting your accounts, if you don't have a plan in place and you've got competitors in the marketplace who see a downturn as opportunity to steal your market share, you're going to get hurt. And, and in many cases, that pain, that hurt is, is so deep that it could take you years to recover from it if you ever recover at all. I think you were being a little bit modest on, on, on what you did. I kind of watched what you did and um, you pushed all your chips to the center, Jeb. Uh, you invested time, money, and creativity, and you went from being great to being world-class. So, I, I don't want that to get lost here with all the good things that have been said. 
it takes a lot of uh, whatever you want to call it. I have some words that are coming to my mind, but they're from my athletic days. And uh, I don't really necessarily want to say them, but it, it takes a lot of guts when things are going sideways to push all the chips and to bet on you and to bet on your company the way you bet on it. And, and you've been rewarded for it. You'll continue to be rewarded from it. And it's not separate from who you are. That That's who you are. You, you're that's a competitor. True. You're that's a winner. True. And your, your inclination is always to push in and to bet on yourself. Mm -hmm. That's yes. why you're who you are. And speaking of betting on yourself, one of my pet peeves in this life is on page 97. I, you know, the first time I heard somebody say, work smarter, not harder. I said, oh, that's, that's nice. And the more I thought about it, the more I said, all right, we should work smarter, definitely. But what would happen if in chapter 26 on page 97, you worked harder, longer, and smarter? That's right. right. That's right. Yeah, the I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the work smarter versus harder. I just think it's an excuse. Uh, for people to uh, to say, well, you know, if you're if you're grinding hard, you're working hard, then there's something wrong with you. And nobody nobody ever failed because they were working hard. Uh, but I've seen a lot of people fail because they were working smart. So, but in a crisis, the the luxury to be smart and not and not work hard goes away. You got to work hard. It is a grind. It is tough. There there. There is a formula for smart. Smart is efficient and effective. In other words, getting as much as you possibly can done in the shortest amount of time with the greatest possible outcome. So there, there is a formula there, but you have to work hard in order to actualize that formula. It, you should not mistake. You, or you should, let me say this a different way. You should not allow yourself the luxury of believing that smart work will outpace hard work. 100%. I'm with you 100%. And I just loved it when I when I when I saw that there's there's a day of reckoning, it's upon us. And yeah, I got I got I got some good news and bad news. You're going to have to work harder, longer and smarter. It's yep. going to take everything we've got and guess what? When you come out on the other end, you're going to be stronger. And your business should be bigger if you get better at the basics. And there's not one of us who, who have done so well and who are so talented that we should ever stop blocking and tackling. And I know people get sick of me saying that, but look at, and Larry Levin does a great job. Uh, uh, Levine does a great job on, on this. Look at how pro athletes look at films. When I played college football and I was only division three college football, I watched films 20 hours a week on my opponents. I knew when that offensive lineman was lead, leaning back, he was pulling. And guess what? I was running the other way and I was sacking his halfback 10 yards deep in, in the backfield because I knew by his tells. And um, we all should use pro athletes as inspiration from the very, very detailed way they analyze our performance. The first step out of the stance. We should look at that and then ask ourselves one very frightening question. Am I paying attention to my sales skills as much as a pro football player or a pro basketball player. And if you look at me like I've got two heads, you really have a problem because I know something about you already. I know you're not committed and I know you don't see yourself as a professional and you're wondering why that analogy, I'm even making that analogy because I'm giving you credit for acknowledging that you're a professional salesperson. If you if you don't see it, I can't help you. Right. Right. And 
so anyway, I just this owning owning your 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 career and understanding that listen, you might have a great boss and you might have a bad boss. But your bosses at the end of the day don't pay your bills. You're accountable to your wife and your children and your husband for how you invest your hours every day in your profession to grow your business. And so the question becomes, what are you doing with it? And we really have three choices with time. And I'm going to let you talk about that a little bit. And then I have something else for you. I'm sorry. I just keep going on and on. Well, the three, you know, every day, every moment, every second of the day, you have three choices with the decision you're going to make about time, right? You can choose to do trivial things like watch cat videos. You can choose to do important things. And there are lots of important things to do, like check your email. And you can choose to do impactful things. And if you're in sales, the most impactful things that you can do is put things through the pipeline, move them, move them, put them in the pipeline, move them through the pipeline, and of course, protect your accounts. And the problem for most sales professionals is not so much trivial. It, the law of triviality just defines how human nature is to take the, the list of things that you have to do every single day and focus on the things that matter the least while saving the things that matter the most to the end. So essentially what you need to do is, is flip that on its head and start your day with making the most impact. The problem for most salespeople is that they confuse important for impact. So they confuse, for example, you know, rather than allowing and delegating someone in the office to chase down an invoice for a customer, they'll spend the afternoon chasing down the invoice and not putting something into the front of the pipeline, not prospecting. So the most impactful thing you can do as a salesperson is put something new into the pipeline, secondarily move it through the pipeline. And, and third is to protect the, your existing accounts by making sure that they know that you care about them. You want to start your day with impact, then move to the important. And if you do that, you'll probably never get to the trivial. And it's all of a, it's all about basically a mindset shift about how you use your time. But in normal times, the greatest predictor of success is how a person uses their time. And that is, that is 10 X during tough times and, uh, and, and volatile times like what we're in right now. I, I just want to unpack um, the whole tyranny of the urgent and time blocking um, a, a little bit. If you're not focused on what's impactful you're going to let urgent things become tyrannical and they're going to, they're going to mess with you. Uh, there's a lot of people that fight time blocking. I was one of them. I'll put my hand up. I, I was guilty of it. Time blocking is the best thing that you guys are ever going to do guys and gals out there. If you're a sales professional and you're not time blocking, you need to start. You have to do that. You have to know when you're doing outbound tasks, when you're doing cleanup tasks, when you're doing Intel, those are all separate activities. And, you know, my bookmark is not an accident. It, it's a reminder. It's a reminder to pick this up. It makes me money. And there's nothing better than being belly to belly with customers and prospects. How do you answer a salesperson that fights you on time blocking? Normally I show them how much they can accomplish. So versus trying to argue them into believing they're wrong, what I'll do is I'll run a high intensity sprint with them. So, so take around, you know, think about, uh, prospecting. So I'll take a group of people. In fact, I'll start doing this next week with a, with a new group of, of reps that I'm running through a fanatical prospecting boot camp. And I'll, I'll, with this group, I'll do 10 minute blocks. So I'll say, we're going to do 10 minutes, 10 dials, and the goal is set one appointment, go. And what they discover is that when we block that time out, that they usually get to 10 dials. Sometimes they don't get quite that many. Sometimes they'll get six or seven, depending on how many conversations they have. They almost always set an appointment. And they're just stunned that they were able to accomplish that because most of them are doing 10 dials maybe in an hour. And then suddenly we're compressing that into 10 minutes. That's called Hortzman's corollary to Parkinson's law. Parkinson's law describes that 
anything, any task that you do has a tendency to expand into the time that you allot for it, right? That's the whole purpose of time blocking. So if you say I've got eight hours a day to do my prospecting, I'll spend the whole eight hours doing the prospecting. Horstman's corollary to Parkinson's law says that work has a tendency to contract into time blocks as, lo as long as the work that you're putting into the time block is reasonable and there is a goal for the outcome. So I, I'm a big fan of 15 minute or 10 minute phone blocks. I'll do, you know, 15 minutes, 15 dollars at one appointment. When I'm writing, for example, I'll typically block my writing into about an hour and then take a break so that during that hour, everything is turned off because I get, believe it or not, I get bored when I'm writing sometimes because I, I get, you know, I'm thinking about things. And so I'll drift into social media, but by blocking that time, I'll say, you know, I'm going to do 200 words in this amount of time and then I'll just write. It's not always really good 200 words, but writing is about editing, not writing. So you just get it on the paper and that works. So the, the, the thing about time blocking for me is if I can show people how, how much better they can be and how much more they can be, more, much more productive they can be, then they'll begin to buy into it. And, uh, and that's what I typically do with anyone. I do it with their, whether they're, they're going through their email, whether they're doing a, you know, a, a creative task. I'll just, we'll get an estimate of how much time we're going to spend on it. And then we block that time. We spend the time on it. Then we move on to the next thing. And usually people are truly, Pete, they are stunned at how much they accomplish when, when they use those high intensity sprints. Yeah. I've always found that anything that we as sales managers ask our salespeople to do, we should be able to do it with them and do it better. And one of the things that I've often said to business owners, if your VP of sales can't go out into the field and close a sale that a salesperson thought was impossible to make, you've got the wrong dude or do that. You, yeah. you, you need to have people that can go and lead the team and not to digress, but I have to say this. What you put in at the end of your book about implementing the price increase and the analogy of going up the mountain was just absolutely brilliant. And <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry that I'm getting off of, off of, uh, off of what we're talking about, but it was so good. It made me laugh and it, it made me make copious notes. I still remember, I think it starts on page 287 and I'm, I'm just going, boy, isn't that exactly the way it is? It's like Jeb's done this before <laughs> <laughs> and he's watched it happen before. And uh, helping people avoid that car wreck is, is, is really important. One of my takeaways from reading your book was this. I have to reread this book. I have to take notes. I have to ask myself one question. Yeah, I know it all, but what, which one piece am I not applying as well as I could? And I would hope that everybody that gets this book, which I hope everybody that listens to this runs out and buys selling in a crisis and not only reads it once, but rereads it, then gets it on audible and listens to it every day because we're going to need it. We're going to need it. And I just want to talk really quickly about what not to do in a crisis. If you believe that you have to watch the news, minimize the time. But I'm going to tell you this. When I sat in the seat and I heard this bald headed, obnoxious guy wearing a red shirt named Jeffrey Gittimer, the king of sales, tell me to stop watching the news. I thought this guy was crazy. And I said, I can't do that. I, that's impossible. I would be uninformed. I would be uneducated, blah, 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 blah. And I said, am I a hundred percent where I want to be? Nope. What would it hurt if I just listened to what I paid this man to tell me right. and apply it? and see if it works or not pragmatically. I mean, I would have loved to have sent Jeffrey a note saying, Jeffrey, I was in the audience in Cleveland, Ohio, 
and you said, don't watch the news and you'll be happier and more productive and a better salesperson. And you were full of crap. I did it and it didn't work. But you know what happened? I stopped watching the news and I've never watched the news since. Right. I'm a happy dude. And this is what I learned. If something big is really going down and it's really big, I have enough people in my life that love me enough yeah. that they're going to call me and tell me to duck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, Jeb, I, uh, I can't read this last part that I want to read because I'll probably start crying because it makes me too emotional. So I'm going to ask you to read it. It's on page 230. And it's the last two paragraphs. It's so powerful that I want everybody to hear this because it is, it's incredible. And if you want to just read the last three paragraphs, you can, but the last two to me, just very, very powerful. And it really shows your heart. And I think it's what the book was all about. I'm funny. This makes you cry because sometimes it makes me choke up too. So I had to be careful with this too. When Sorry. I was doing the when I was doing the audio book, I had to do this three or four times to keep myself from uh, from uh, cracking up when I did it. But uh, basically, the this this last this last part of the book is really focused on you as a sales professional and the fact that you're the leading edge going into a crisis. So you're going to know it before anyone else does, and and you're the people that are going to take us out of the crisis. So the, the, the sales world we're everybody's counting on us. So I, I, I basically talk about this con this, this analogy of a Cape that you're a superhero, that your Cape that you, that you wear is woven from the basics and fundamentals of selling and the willingness to do the hard things that most people want, like persistence and drive and the relentless desire to help your customers achieve their objectives you make a difference. You keep your company strong and financial vi financially viable. And one sale at a time, you play the most important role in your organization and the economy as a whole. So you should lift your shoulders up, stick your chin out, and be proud. You should look forward, not backwards. You should stay focused, be persistent, remain relentless, and always, always, always trust your cape. Amen, brother. This was such a treat, such a great book. It will be my companion through this crisis and any others that we have. I would remind everybody out there, um, we've been through this before. I, I've been s selling for 40 years. This is my sixth recession. And whether or not it's a recession or something worse in 2023, I really don't care. I I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to work harder I'm going to work smarter and I'm going to make it happen. And the dealers that I'm in business with, I'm going to do everything a human being can do to make sure my dealers are successful. And I hope you do too. And I hope that you guys run out and get selling in a crisis by Jeb Blunt. Um, Jeb, do you have any last words you'd like to say before we sign off? Well, thank you so much for having me on. This has been a wonderful conversation. I'm going to walk out of here with my shoulders up and my my uh, and feeling strong because uh, it feels like we made the mark. I, I I'm just like you. I would encourage people pick up this book, read a little bit every single day. I'm in love with this book because it, when I was in your shoes, if someone had written this book, I would be carrying it around with me. It would be my Bible. And I, I hope that you'll find this, the same value in it. And I hope that you'll go grab it and shoot me a note on social media or send me an email. Uh, my email's in the back of all my books. I mean, I don't know if the, a lot of people realize that, but you can send me a direct email and, uh, and, and tell me what you think. Thanks, Jeb. Have Thank a great you. day. Thanks, Pete. Take care.